I grew up with a strong Jewish identity and participated in many aspects of Jewish life in my hometown. My Canadian upbringing not only taught me to take pride in my Jewish heritage, but also ingrained in me the virtues of tolerance and multiculturalism. Fast forward 20 years later, where I find myself living with my husband, John, and our young family in arguably the most progressive district in Minnesota. I often worry about my future for my children in America, because for the first time in my life, my identity is under attack by those who claim that Zionism is incompatible with civil and human rights. I reject these accusations of incompatibility. Zionism, a movement for the self-determination of the Jewish people in our indigenous homeland, is by definition progressive. To be clear, criticizing specific policies of the Israeli government is not anti-Semitic. I've done it myself. However, demonizing Israel, undermining its legitimacy as a state, advocating for its dissolution, applying double standards, and distorting the conflict between Israel and its neighbors crosses the line into anti-Semitism. So, how do we deal with this new reality where on the one hand, we hear chants from neo-Nazis saying, Jews will not replace us, and on the other, we are accused of being oppressors and colonialists. I don't have all the answers, but I can share some of my strategies with you here today. First, I volunteer my time by serving on the board of JCRC. JCRC works to build relationships with all communities, to educate the public about Israel and anti-Semitism, and to advocate for issues of importance to the Jewish community, such as Holocaust education in our schools. I'm also the leader, a leader in Zioness, a national grassroots organization fighting for the advancement of social, racial, economic, environmental, and gender justice in America, as well as fighting for Zionism and the inclusion of Zionist and social justice spaces. Because we have learned that if we don't have a voice at the table, others will speak for us. Finally, I educate myself on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and on anti-Semitism so that when I do encounter it, I have the confidence to respond. I use my voice and my keyboard to correct inaccuracies and defend against anti-Semitism. None of these approaches may be for you, and that is okay. But what is important is that each of you find your own way to get involved because this moment is teaching us that complacency is not the answer. Whether that means having, your, having a conversation with your neighbor about the two-state solution, talking to your kids about the memes on Instagram, attending a rally like this one today, or writing a letter to your representative, find your own way to support the Jewish people. Because Jewish history has shown us time and again Ultimately, it is up to us to fight against anti-Semitism. Yes, the Jewish community undoubtedly has some true friends and allies for whom we are eternally grateful. And for those of you who are here with us today, we can't thank you enough. But at the end of the day, it is our responsibility. So I'm asking all of you, let's put our differences aside. Let's stand up proudly for the Jewish people against anti-Semitism, wherever and whenever we see it, even if it makes us uncomfortable. Our people did not thrive for thousands of years by avoiding discomfort. Instead, we did it by grit, by unity, by pursuing justice, by tikkun olam, and most importantly, by our unrelenting refusal to give up. So today, I pledge to you, I refuse to give up, and I'm counting on all of you not to give up either. For those who came before us, for those who came before us, for those who are here with us today, and for the generations who will come after us, Am Yisrael Chai.
All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Toby Kabi. I'm a high schooler in the West Metro area. In light of the recent rise in anti-Semitism, it has become apparent that people in my generation have become prominent perpetrators of hate speech and violence against Jews. For me and my Jewish peers, we feel alone now more than ever. We have seen all forms of hate, from being, but, from being the butt of Nazi jokes to being called stupid Jews in person and on social media. As we move further away from the Holocaust, anti-Semitism ed education has faltered in schools. This is outrageous. Why does it have to take us dying to get non-Jews to learn about anti-Semitism? This has been a question me and my peers have asked in frustration. Furthermore, even combating anti-Semitism has gotten even more difficult, as bigots and anti-Semites are now simply just replacing the word Jew with the word Israel to veil their anti-Semitism. Of course, for us Jews, we're able to see right through the veil. But for the general public, these comments attract zero backlash. As Jews, we aren't strangers to the position we are in. Despite making up only 2% of the US population, Anti-Semitic hate crimes make up for over half of religious hate crimes in the U.S. in the past years, according to FBI statistics. Now more than ever, we need strong Jewish communities to fight back against hate. It can't be just a faction of us. We have to be united, regardless of observance levels or personal beliefs. If we stand together, if we stand together as one Jewish community, Anti-Semitism cannot and will not tear us down. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Ron Lance, State Senator. I work in this building behind us. These are words worth repeating. First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. This is the poetic form of a 1946 post-war confessional prose by the German Lutheran pastor Martin Niemöller, who lived from 1892 to 1984. It is about the cowardice of German intellectuals and certain clergy, including by his own admission Niemöller himself, following the Nazis' rise to power and subsequent incremental purging of their chosen targets, group after group. We welcome and need the voices of the non-Jewish community to defend us as we have worked to defend them. Indeed, we Jews have been more than just partners in justice equally engaged in seeking justice around the world. We have led movements, stood alongside others leading movements, fought hard on the front lines, pierced the shields of prejudice on the tips of the spears, and died doing so. We do this for not only the utilitarian reason that we do not wish to be left standing alone at the end with no one left to help us, but also because Judaism calls upon us to do that which is the morally compelling right thing to do. Yet, ultimately, we know that we must rely on ourselves more than any others to take care of ourselves. When the broader community voices lag behind in responding to anti-Semitism, we know that we must step up to protect ourselves. As the incidents of anti-Semitism continue to rise and outpace the incidents of bias-motivated attacks on any other group, we must confront and defeat it on many fronts. Each of the organizations represented here today, and each of you, do this in important ways. We in the legislature try to do so as well. My colleague and friend, Representative Frank Hornstein, who by the way is out of town today and could not join us, and I have teamed up to pass hate crimes legislation in the past 
enhancing sentences for crimes motivated by bias. We recognize that crimes motivated by bias are not only crimes against the individual victim, but are also attacks on the whole community that person belongs to. Representative Horstein and I are teaming up again to expand upon that legislation to change Minnesota's laws on crimes motivated by bias. To direct the Commission of Human Rights to, to collaborate with the Board of Peace Officer Standards and Training regarding the training of peace officers in identifying crimes motivated by bias and to seek reports from community organizations, schools, and individuals regarding such crimes. To expand the crime of assault motivated by bias to include bias due to a person's gender, gender identity, or gender expression and against a person who associates with someone in a protected group. To add the sentencing enhancement to second and third degree property crime damages. To expand reporting and training requirements for police officers. And to provide funding to the Office of Justice Programs for grants to nonprofits to provide support services for victims of bias motivated crimes. Now, I am confident that we will eventually pass this legislation. Note that it applies to bias against a whole range of communities not just Jews. We will protect ourselves and others because it protects ourselves and because it is the right thing to do. We, all of us here and not here, unite in our own realms of action across the political and philosophical and ideological spectrum within the Jewish community to oppose anti-Semitism wherever it appears, even in the highest halls of power. There is no hiding place, there is no exception, and there is no longer any patience. There is no room for deferral, diffusion, deflection, delusion, or explanation. There is no space for silence. Every expression and every act must be called out, and every utterer and actor must be held accountable. Words matter. They hurt our personal and collective conscience, and they beget action. We unite in our words and our actions condemning anti-Semitism, and call upon those in power to echo our call by their own words and deeds. me to speak after the senator, not cool. <laughs> I just want to say. My name is David Goldenberg, and I'm the Midwest Regional Director of the Anti-Defamation League. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here with so many friends from JCRC and so many other groups. My new colleague, Wendy Huggison, who is our Minnesota State Director, and so many of our board members here. So it's great to see everyone here. ADL was founded in 1913 with a dual mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to ensure just and fair treatment for all. For the past 40 plus years, ADL has tracked anti-Semitic incidents. And sadly, the last four years have been the four highest number of incidents that we have tracked in more than four decades. We've also seen here in the Midwest an 84% increase in the number of incidents. And here's what concerns me the most. Across the country, we've seen a roughly 19% increase in anti-Semitic incidents in K through 12 schools. Tragically and scaringly here in the Midwest, we've seen a 55% increase in anti-Semitic incidents in K through 12 schools. Think about that. Now that doesn't mean that every kid, we have a rise in anti-Semitism or bigotry in these schools, but what we're finding is that younger people are experimenting with hate in ways that they have never experimented it with it before. 
Long gone are those days where you have to find a meeting in the darkness of the night to ex be exposed to anti-Semitism and to extremism. Instead, you just pick up one of these. And within seconds, you have access to anti-Semitism, to hate symbols, to hate speech, to hate groups, not only in your community, not only in our country, but around the world. The access to technology, the toxicity of the political vitriol that we hear, and the civic conversations, think about the conversations you can't have around the dinner table anymore, and think about that. We know that for centuries, Jews and anti-Semitism have been the canary in the coal mine. When Jews are attacked, not far behind are other marginalized groups. Often, and what's really concerning, is that when it comes to dog whistles, if you think about it, it's usually only the dog that hears the whistles. What we're seeing play out today in American politics, in civic society, in schools, and on the streets of Minneapolis and St. Paul, of Chicago, of New York, of Washington DC, of Los Angeles, I can go on and on and on, is that we all see and we all hear those dog whistles. So when we hear them and when we see them, we must speak out. Not only when it hate and anti-Semitism is directed toward the Jewish community, but to Asian Americans, to black Americans, to all people in the United States. We must share facts. We know that anti-Semitic tropes are based in falsehoods and lies just like other isms and obias, and we must speak out. And lastly, we must show strength. We must be there for one another. We have to call it out when it occurs on the right. We have to call it out when it occurs on the left. We have to call it out when it occurs within our own communities, within our own families, within our own society. The time is now and is incumbent upon each and every single one of us to look in the mirror and to say, what am I doing? Am I saying, Hineni, I am here? Because folks, friends, that's how we make things happen. Thank you. Thank you for keeping it warm for me up here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Karen Moratz. I'm the director of Jewish Community Action. You know, five years ago, a friend and I cleaned anti-Semitic graffiti off of a building in North Minneapolis, just a few blocks from where I live. Uh, and my friend tweeted about it, which triggered a series of racist and anti-Semitic attacks on us on social media. And it was the most afraid I could remember being at the time, um, especially because I realized that the people sending us these threats, these violent images, could be anyone. The man shopping near me in Target could be literally sending me threatening email from his phone in the produce aisle. And at the time, I was very afraid. And I know that some in our community, maybe some of us here, have also been afraid lately. And as someone whose name and contact information is on the website of a Jewish organization, I get it. And I know that fear can sometimes push us to isolate ourselves. We can find ourselves alone, out of community, out of relationship. So I wanna start by thanking everyone for coming together. Um, and if you fought fear or the urge to isolate in order to be here today with us, thank you. Now I wanna say that our community is not alone in our fear. Um, hateful, as you've heard, hateful rhetoric and violent attacks on Asian Americans have doubled just in the last two years since 2019. And at a time when we think we've come very far in acceptance and inclusion, violence against trans people was at the highest last year than any time in our history. But there is reason to be hopeful. Just as data validates that attacks have increased, data also shows there are ways to defeat it. Education works, social programs work. Studies show that when people work together on something across lines of difference, bigotry decreases and understanding and relationships grow. So if we're not alone in being targeted in knowing what it is to be afraid, we know we can only be stronger together. 
Now, JCA has been working to fight hate through education and policy, and we do all of that in partnership and coalition, both with other Jews and other targeted groups. And for the last two years, with tremendous support from some of our friends here at the JCRC and CJW and ADL, we've organized a broad coalition that includes Asian Americans and Muslim groups and LGBTQ organizations. And we've worked to pass a bill that would strengthen the state's response to hate crimes. We built policy that would give organizations like ours the ability to tell our community stories and to have those stories form a bigger picture of what's happening in Minnesota. Now this bill received several hearings in the House and key pieces of it made it to the end of the session in an omnibus bill. And I wanna thank Senator Latz for authoring this bill in the Senate. <laughs> and for being a champion for the entire coalition. But we didn't receive a hearing in the Senate. And negotiations in negotiations at the end of the session, all provisions of our bill were removed by Senate leadership. So in a year when anti-Semitism, when hate against Asian Americans, and trans folks and so many others is clearly presenting itself, and we see it, Senate leadership, some of the folks who go to work in this building behind me, didn't think hate crimes were important enough for even a hearing. And that's troubling to me and maybe to you. But our coalition is strong and we'll be back next year. And part of why we're so optimistic that we will win is the solidarity and relationships that have formed between our groups and our communities. If fear can push us to isolation, solidarity can bust through that fear and make us whole. But we need to talk to each other. I can't let my fear push me to build a bunker whose walls are so thick that I can't hear my neighbor ask for help. And what can my own safety mean if it comes at the expense of my neighbors and my neighbor is still afraid? So often when you think about what safety feels like, it's really belonging and being connected and knowing that someone has your back. This gathering gives me hope. There are so many groups and members of our community present, a huge range of voices. I would echo my rabbi, Rabbi Rappaport, that some of us disagree with each other on pieces of our work, which by the way is an extremely Jewish position to take. <laughs> and that's awesome. But we're all here together united, and I know that our theme is united against anti-Semitism, but what I hope for us, what I know we're really doing here today, is uniting for community, and for connectedness, and for a vision of safety and solidarity that lets us all thrive. For a Jewish community that shows up for each other, and for our neighbors today and always. Thank you. Whoever had me follow Karen Moratz, not cool. <laughs> Hi everybody, good afternoon. I'm Christy Wesson, uh, NCJW Minnesota's Director of Communications and Programming. I am also, I'm also not wearing sunscreen, which may have been a mistake today. Um, NCJW has been working in Minnesota since 1893, 13 years before this capital was built, and just 25 years after Minnesota became a state. Wow. For 128 years, we have been working to improve the quality of life for all women, children, and families. There's an insidious side to NCJW's origin story, though. Jewish women, Jews generally, are relentless in our pursuit for just, of justice for all. And what could be more American? But back in 1893, Jews weren't welcome in the mainstream, in the mainstream white Christian women's organizations that were devoted to community service. So we did as Jews have always done. We started our own organization, and we worked alongside other marginalized communities toward our shared liberation. Because as Jews, we know that liberty is inseparable from liberty and justice for all. As time passed, European Jews became assimilated and began to benefit from our whiteness. We were afforded access to mobility and wealth building opportunities that other communities were not and continue to be excluded from. In our coalitions and partnerships with our allies, we developed and are continuing to work on the best ways to honor our history, participate with empathy, and also understand that those of us who are white Jews occupy, occupy a place of unearned power and privilege. And often, we've chosen to ignore our experiences of anti-Semitism, to let the microaggression slide, to laugh it off. And what we've done ourselves, and what we've done ourselves and our allies is a disservice in the process. 
We've allowed the tropes to continue and the small things have grown and we found ourselves in this very lonely place where the temptation is to become insular, to gather in only places like this. And where solidarity, and while solidarity among Jews is important and healing, I want to challenge all of us to continue to nurture partnerships and friendships outside of the Jewish community. Work in diverse coalitions like the Communities Combating Hate Coalition led by JCA and JCRC that's working to strengthen Minnesota's hate crimes legislation, which you've heard about today. And let's call in our friends and allies to conversation and learning when anti-Semitism occurs, because it will, and embrace the opportunity to, uh, opportunity to build empathy, understanding, and compassion so times like these don't continue to feel so lonely and isolating. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rabbi Shmuley Silverstein from Chabad, Minneapolis, and on behalf of thank you, and on behalf of all of the Chabad rabbis and rebbitzins in Minnesota, I want to thank the JCRC and all of our co-sponsors of this most important event, and I want to thank all of you for coming out this afternoon to unite together against anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is one of the world's oldest, ugliest, most vicious forms of hatred, racism, and bigotry. And that, that's why it's the moral duty of every decent human being to denounce, to condemn anti-Semitism, especially those in positions of leadership with vast influence, to condemn and denounce every form of anti-Semitism, whether it is convenient and comfortable, or whether it is not, regardless from which direction of the political aisle it comes from. It always has to be condemned in the strongest of terms. But friends, ultimately, anti-Semitism is a form of darkness. There are many powerful ways and important ways that we've heard of how to combat darkness. But I think perhaps a very effective way of combating darkness is through light. We all know when you have a large room filled with darkness, Yes, we have to identify the darkness, we have to condemn the darkness, we have to denounce the darkness. But if you come into that room and you light one small candle, as our sages tell us, a little bit of light can dispel a great amount of darkness. So friends, anti-Semitism as we know is a global issue. It seeps into every single part of the world in all types of shapes and forms. So we have a global task at hand. But I'm reminded of the words of a very wise man. He said, when I was young, I was ambitious and I was set to change the whole world. But with time, I grew and I saw changing the world is far too large of a task. So I decided, let me change my country but that too was too big. So I turned to changing my city and then my community. And he says, now I'm 80 years old and I've come to realize the only thing that I can change is myself. But then he added, but if I would have realized this when I was young, I could have changed the entire world. <laughs> so friends, we've heard so many important things that people in positions of leadership and supporting legislators can do, but what can we do as individuals? We don't have a global impact, but friends, we can make a difference in our own homes, in our own lives, with the people that we come in contact with. How do we combat darkness with light? Darkness, anti-Semitism is, is a darkness of lies. Anti-Semites spew lies about Judaism, about Jews, about Israel. We combat that darkness, first and foremost, by educating ourselves, about the truth, about Judaism, about Jews and about Israel, and we share it with others. Anti-Semitism, it's a unique 
form of hatred that needs to be countered with that same unique form of love. What do I mean? Anti-Semites possess an indiscriminate hate for Jews. I can assure you that that evil person, if you call them a person, who attacked the Chabad rabbi in Boston two weeks ago, did not ask him, before I attack you, are you Reform, Conservative, or Orthodox? Were you born in America or are you an immigrant? Do you vote right or left? It was irrelevant. That attacker knew one thing, you're Jewish, so I hate you. Friends, we need to counter that darkness with that same form of light and love. All these labels, Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, Atheist, Believer, Right, Left, all they are is labels. And you know what labels are for? Suits, not people. <laughs> so let us not change the world, but practically speaking, think for a moment. Is there one person who I used to be friendly with that I now broke that friendship because of differences of opinion? Then let us counter the darkness of bigotry and hate with unconditional, indiscriminate love, putting differences aside and re-embracing those people who we disagree with. I'm reminded of a story about my teacher, the Lubavitcher Rebbe of Righteous Memory, who had a uh, disagreement with another rabbi, back and forth, back and forth, and after some time, the Rebbe wrote to him and said as follows. God was very generous. He gave us a smorgasbord of 613 mitzvot. It seems like on this mitzvah, we're not gonna agree. So let us collaborate on the other 612 mitzvot where we do agree. I think that is what we can do. Find area of commonality where we can collaborate and work together. Number two, we cannot grant the anti-Semites victory. What do anti-Semites want? They want us to feel intimidated. They want us to be fearful. They want us to take our Judaism into the bunker and to hide our Jewish identity. Let us not grant them that victory. Let us be proud Jews in the open, wearing our kippahs, our chais, our Star of Davids, affixing our mezuzot on the front doors, on the outside of our home. Let us not. Yes, absolutely, we should ensure the proper measures for safety and security. But let us not grant them that victory that they want of Jews in hiding. Let us be proud Jews. And finally, King Solomon tells us, Kiner mitzvah. The Torah or a mitzvah, a good deed, a commandment is a candle and the Torah is light. Our most potent tool that has carried us through all the storms of history is that we held on to the light of a mitzvah. Friends, when you take a small coin and you put it into a charity box, that mitzvah of tzedakah fills you, your home and your life with light, with positive energy. When you light the Shabbat candles Friday evening, in addition to the physical light that warms, it fills your home with a godly, spiritual energy of holiness, of beauty, of peace. When we take time in our day to study the beautiful wisdom of Torah, it lifts us up. It brings light into our lives. And when we are filled with life, when we are filled with positive